talking NBA with Kendrick Perkins, and we get the scoop on the bizarre story of the Colorado staffer who traveled to the Middle East without telling the school in search of NIL money. Plus, we get the latest on college football, and we check in on two of MLB's more woeful teams. It's Monday, September 23rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're getting Kendrick Perkins' thoughts on all the big issues in today's NBA. We're also joined by reporter Jill Painter-Lopez and my colleague AJ Perez. They have exclusive reporting on the case of Trevor Riley, who is no longer a part of the Colorado football program after he independently sought NIL money from Saudi Arabia. Plus, we'll check in on the White Sox as they approach the wrong kind of history, and an all-star who is demoted for pulling an all-nighter. First, here are your top headlines. AJ Wilson has been awarded her third WNBA MVP. It was her second unanimous selection, a feat only achieved previously by Cynthia Cooper Dyke in 1997. Wilson's dominant 2024 season saw her average 26.9 points to go along with 12 rebounds and 2.6 blocks per game. She also broke the league's scoring record, becoming the first player to exceed 1,000 points in a single campaign. Equally unsurprising was Caitlin Clark's unanimous selection as AP Rookie of the Year. To top off her stellar season, she is now the featured face on the highest priced WNBA card ever. This weekend, Clark's signed WNBA draft card sold for $84,000, clearing the previous record of $78,000 that was set by, you guessed it, a Caitlin Clark card from her time at Iowa. Perry St. Germain no longer employs Kylian Mbappe, he now plays for Real Madrid. What is less clear is if PSG still owes him $62 million. The player and the team are in a dispute over their final contract. PSG says that they had a verbal agreement that saved the team that lofty sum. Mbappe's legal team says that deal was never signed and the team should pay up. The team was told to pay in a non-binding ruling by the League Day Football Professional. PSG is appealing to the National Joint Appeal Committee. The Philadelphia 76ers and star center Joel Embiid agreed to a three-year, $193 million contract extension over the weekend, marking the largest per-year extension in NBA history and the first shams bomb of the post-Woj era. As the Sixers' future in Philadelphia seems up in the air, Embiid's future with the team is set in stone for now. Up next, Kendrick Perkins won a championship with the Boston Celtics and got to watch them do it again as an ESPN analyst. We spoke about what he's learned from seeing the game as a media member, how college NIL is going to change the NBA, and who could dethrone his former team this coming season. I had a lot of fun talking to him, and that conversation is next. Very excited to be joined now by former NBA player, current ESPN analyst, and co-founder of Nilly, Kendrick Perkins. Welcome, Kendrick. Owen, how you doing, man? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah, really great to have you on. So, big question to start. You had a long career in the NBA, and now you're a regular on ESPN. Has your time in the media changed how you see the business side of basketball? Oh, absolutely. Um, And, and, and you know what? It also has, I've gained a, a, a lot of respect for people that work in the media and the day-to-day uh you know, work that they put in behind the scenes um, and how hard it is to cover any sport, not just the NBA, but, you know, you view it a lot differently now, right? From a numbers aspect, from a ratings aspect, which player is is more popular, which team is going to drive ratings, et cetera, et cetera. So now you're diving into all the back end stuff as a player, you just wanted to hoop and be on TV, right? You wanted to see what national televised games you, 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 you know, your team was having or whatever. But on the other side of things, you actually see what teams and what, what players actually move the needle and, and how to move the needle uh, just being in this media space. And yet is, I mean, from, from my end of things, I feel like, um, you know, occasionally I'll hear athletes not complain about me specifically, but say, you know, like, oh, the media, like, you know, tells things a certain way and that doesn't always like work for us. And, you know, obviously we see a lot of athletes telling their own stories now, which is great. Um, but, you know, obviously on, on our end, we're not trying to, um, you know, cast people in a certain light that might be mm-hmm. favorable or unfavorable. We're just trying to tell a good story basically. Um, it, and I think, but when you're the subject of that story, that can be a little uncomfortable. It, it can be, but this is what I tell a lot of young athletes, uh, whether they're, you know, they got the potential to go to, you know, the professional sports, whether that's the NBA or NFL, uh, you know, major league baseball, whatever it may be. I always tell them like, you know, it's the fortune, right? And the fame. And sometimes on that, with that being said, it's the good fame and it's the bad fame, right? You dictate that fame. I mean, you can't dictate if you're going to play well every night. Like no one's perfect, 
but it just comes with the territory. This is what you signed up for, right? And I think now we see because a lot of guys have platforms on social media, they're able to respond publicly, right? But, you know, um, KG always told me, I remember this, this was the one of the most important messages I had throughout in my life. He was like, just like you run home to turn on the TV when you have a good game, keep that same energy when you have a bad game and use that to motivate you not to get in your feelings. You know, and of course the NBA has got an interesting role in all this is they want, they want every game to be dramatic and exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and they want, you, they don't want teams to just kind of like fall off and like for their fans to feel like they don't have a chance. So I feel like, you know, that's what's motivating the in season tournament, of course, to like try to make those early season games more compelling um, and also the new salary rules uh, around um, how it's it's harder to um, uh, they're trying to make it so there's a true cap basically right um, so you know we don't have just like teams that are just buying up all the top players do you think they've been taking the right approach in terms of you know building out this product and and making it so every fan can be engaged I do and the number says the number says that Adam Silver and the NBA are doing an excellent job and even. When you just think about the addition of the play-in tournament, you had so many people, right, that was, like, bashing it, like, man, why are we doing this? You had players that were mad about. Yeah, LeBron hated it. Right. <clears throat> but it was it was actually, to me, one of the best things that happened for our game because now, you know, teams can't take the regular season for granted anymore. And now the competition is, a, is at a different level. Now, all of a sudden, they, they they put in rules where in order to qualify for individual accolades, you got to reach a certain amount of games. I think that's a great thing as well because, you know, you have people paying their hard-earned money to, to to go see these stars, especially on road games when these stars are, these superstars are traveling. And it's a bummer, man, when you didn't pay, you know, 1500 or 2000 for some great seats to see – a LeBron James or a Steph Curry or a Giannis or Kevin Durant, Anthony Edwards, et cetera, and you show up and they're not there. That's why I love Anthony Edwards so much because he's every former player, favorite player, because it's, it's not just what he brings on the floor. It's his mentality, right? It's his approach. It's how he's always available. It's how he ha handles adversity, and he wants to thrive and be the best in this situation. Yeah, I, I think Drew Holiday said he was by far the biggest trash talker on, on Team USA, too. Mm -hmm. so, um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, of course, one of the most obvious ways that Adam Silver has has done well for the league is that this new media rights deal, you know, $76 billion, uh, basically tripling what, what they had before. How do you think that's going to change the league? Well, I think it's a great thing because now you're going to have more national televised games, right? So... And that's great for the players because now we're going to be able to see a lot of small market teams uh, be on national television, right? Like we're going to be seeing a, a young and up and coming team like the Orlando Magic and be able to shine a light on a, on a young man like Paolo Bancaro, right? We're going to be able to see Evan Mobley from the Cleveland Cavaliers and, and his strives to continue to be great and make all-stars and all NBAs. We're going to see guys like Scotty Barnes, right? who we don't get to see on the regular. So I think it's, it's more opportunity for the players because the more that you're seen on television, on national television, and there's no knock on league pass, but again, when your games are in bars or on in bars, restaurants, right, you get more visibility and it's better for their personal brand. Let's hop over to Nilly. So you co-founded this company, it's an NIL company uh, that's quickly becoming a crowded space. But from what I can tell, Nilly has some unique features. You offer college athletes upfront payments and you provide some education around finances and NIL. If you could fill out that picture for us, how does this whole thing operate? Well, I mean, <clears throat> so Nilly is, is basically, uh, we have a platform that gives student athletes right um an opportunity to tap into the nil earnings early right and you could be depending on what state you're in you could be a junior in high school a senior in high school um and you could tap in early to get an advance based on what you're going to make in the nil space and uh <clears throat> and you know i think when you look around and you see 
a lot of these young men and women come from the similar backgrounds, whether they're single parent households or even both parents in the household, the day to day struggle. And we're in a different age now. Right. If you're in high school and you're playing sports, it's basically year round, whether that's football, basketball, you're traveling. You know, I have a son. I have a few sons. But at one point I had to look up and I was literally traveling, traveling the United States with my middle child. And we end up spending like twenty two thousand dollars just on travel expenses throughout that season. And that was it hit me like, oh, man, no, we're not doing this again. So I could only imagine, you know, what it's doing to other people. And so this gives an opportunity to have that financial freedom. You know, if you want to go out and you want to invest um, into to anything that you want to do to start your career, like, you know, to start investment opportunities, we, we advance from 50K all the way up to $4 million, Right. And it's no, like, we don't ask for your social security number. This is solely based on what you're going to make when you get to college in the NIL space. If you get hurt, if you get hurt, you don't make NIL money, you don't have to pay it back. And we have a structure in place where if a kid gets or a student athlete gets, you know, a $200,000 advance, right, we advance them, they sign up with nearly and they get to college, say if they're starting their senior year in high school and they wait a year, get to college, and their first check is $100,000, the way we have it structured is they have options. Out of that $100,000, they could take 25% of it and pay towards the advance, or they could take 50% and pay towards the advance. It's solely based on the uh, comfort level of the student athlete and how quickly they want to pay the advance back. But yeah, we have a nice structure of uh, the way that it's structured out, and I think it's good, man. Uh, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great deal to have. Uh, we're the only platform that offer this. It's a high risk on our end, but I, we think it's well worth it. Yeah, and apparently Harlan Capital also thinks it's well worth it. They've earmarked two hundred million dollars toward yeah. toward these deals. Uh, how did that deal come together? Well, I mean, it took time. Obviously, right, we, we started this. Chris Richardi and I started uh, nearly February the 20th, uh, I believe it was. Yeah, February the 20th. So really only about nine months, nine, eight or nine months in. And what we did was we had to do a lot of legwork, right? And that's, that's, that's getting athletes to sign up, making sure the structure was in place and uh, we had multiple uh, conversations with Harlan Capital. You know, uh, it, it was a process, right? And you know, they saw it. They saw it was a great product, and and they wanted to do a partnership. And, and we was we was happy and welcomed them welcomed them with open arms. But it's just the start at what we're gonna you know continue to do over here at Nilly. But you know, when you think about the experience that Chris Rashardi has had. Uh, you know, in the financial space, uh, you know, he has another company that he he he's had called Edley that you know does student loans for college students in the medical field. So, and with my brand and being visible and being able to reach the athletes, it was a, a match made in heaven all across the board. And then when Harlan Capital came in, uh, it was just another like boost uh, of energy that they gave us and we excited about the partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, would you have stayed in college longer if you had, if NIL is available to you? Absolutely. I mean, one of the main reasons, uh, on that, I, that I actually went straight to the league one, it was my, it was my dream. Okay. Let me not, you know, like downplay that every, I wanted to go to the NBA, but it was because of the financial situation I was in. You know, I was raised by my grandparents. My grandmother made about $60 a week. My grandfather made $300 a month uh, being a local uh, church janitor. And so we grew up in a home that my great-grandfather built. And my whole motivation was that I wanted to get my grandparents out of that situation. Uh, my first time ever going on the AAU trip, I remember it like it was yesterday. My grandmother, I went to Las Vegas when I was in the eighth grade. My grandmother gave me uh, $20 for like five days and rolls of pennies. So I say that because if 
I did have that opportunity to make money the way that these student athletes are making going to college. I probably would have took a different direction. Most likely I would have. I had signed with the University of Memphis and was going to play for John Calipari. And I was already projected to be like a a late first rounder, second rounder out of high school. And uh, Coach Cal kept telling me, hey, Kendrick, look, if you come here, Perk, I'm telling you I'm going to make you a lottery pick. And it's just – I couldn't just – if I – and, and I wanted to go. I was going to go if I didn't get a guarantee to go in the first round. But once Boston guaranteed to pick me after my workout, I was out. And I have to imagine you feel that other athletes are going to make that same choice. I mean, or that make the choice you would have made uh, because they can make good money, you know, as a junior or senior in college, uh, they might stick around a little longer. But And, and think about it, right? You, I mean, look at Shadua Sanders right now and, and what – he's making and how he's capitalizing on his college career, right? At Colorado. I mean, he's making millions right now, right? He's he's gonna have an established brand before he even go to the NFL, right? He's like and and I think that's a great thing, right? If you shouldn't have to rush the process because of financial situations. And I'm glad that colleges are now getting on board with actually paying these athletes. I believe in like, what was it? In 2023, colleges made about, you know, $15 billion. And I'm pretty sure that number in 2024 is gonna probably be double, especially with the emergence of, of women's basketball, college basketball, Caitlin Clark, the numbers that they did with Angel Reese. So, I mean, it's only fair, but these athletes have an opportunity before they, you know, especially when you're talking about the ones that's, that are going to the professional ranks, they have an opportunity right now to start like generational wealth along with like having a big brand before they even reach the uh, NFL or the NBA. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And before we let you go, I've got a few lightning round questions for you. Uh, just real quick. So you obviously won a championship right. with the Celtics. What was it like watching them win a championship this past season? You know what? It was it was actually fulfilling, right? Knowing what it means to be a Boston Celtic, knowing the fan base, how they pour their heart and soul into their team, good and bad, knowing that the struggle that you saw, the, the well, not struggle, but the adversity that Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have been through in the last few years from falling short. To finally see them get over the hump was a beautiful thing to see. Um, and how do you feel about the team getting sold? Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes you got to make business decisions. I think, I think when you think about it, right, it's it's <laughs> it's kind of crazy because you look at their their starting five and the salary. They're probably all it's probably close to a billion dollars just in the starting five alone, right? And so. You know, I remember when Wick Grosbeck and uh, the ownership group, they actually bought the Boston Celtics. That was They bought it in 2003. I was drafted to the organization. So, you know, what they did for this franchise and turning it around, delivering two championships, getting it back relevant where it needs to be, and also raising the value, I tell you what, that's one hell of a flip, ain't it? <laughs> Um, the 76ers might move across the Delaware to play in New Jersey. Does that feel wrong or is it, you know, whatever, they're close enough? Uh, why, though? Like, you know what I mean? Like, Philly, like, this, we're talking about, like, an historical franchise, like a city, right? Like, it's nothing like going and play in that, that, that arena, right? You put Philly right there in the conversation with Boston, L.A., New York. Like, when you go to Philly, you can feel the hostility. Like, like one of the best – fan bases ever like don't don't it's not broke yeah like let it be it won't even feel the same if if you could take your your prime self and put yourself on any nba team right now except for the celtics who would you do who would you take i would go with the oklahoma city Th no i would go with the minnesota timberwolves because i gotta go play i i gotta go play I, I would love to go play with anthony edwards i don't care like we can share the court for five to six minutes but i just need to be a part of that organization and watch that young man it's something you know when i got traded from the celtics and i was able to to uh to oklahoma city and i sat back and i was able to watch kevin durant a young kevin durant a young james harden a young russell westbrook work out 
it was something amazing to see and what they did with their craft. I get that same type of energy from a guy like Anthony Edwards. And uh, in the Eastern Conference, you've got, obviously the Celtics are still top dog, but there's a maybe three, four teams that could be pretty interesting. Who would you take out of there? I'm looking at the Knicks. They're loaded. They're deep. Um, they made a lot of noise last season. Jalen Brunson, obviously, in my opinion, was the best player in the Eastern Conference last season. You're getting Julius Randle back. They just got Mikael Bridges. Tom Thibodeau has a lot to choose from. I think the togetherness that we're going to see from that team, they're going to be really, really good defensively. Offensively, they're going to have to figure some things out. You know, how Tibbs want to play his rotations, who's going to play at the four, who's going to play at the five, if he's going to start Mitchell Robinson, or, you know, all those things. But, you know, those, those guys – along with OG and Anobi, uh getting a full training camp under their belt, it's going to be scary for the rest of the league. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty deep right now. Um, and finally, give me a team out of the West. You got T-Wolves, or who do you have? I got, right now, I got Oklahoma City. Uh, what they did last year, SGA is a young superstar. Jalen Williams is an all-star in the making. But you add Isaiah Hardenstein to what Chet Holmgren brings to the table – that duo is going to be special. And then you add uh, Alice Caruso, which was a steal, another steal by Sam Presti to the mix. I mean, that team expectations, like, there's no reason they shouldn't be in the NBA Finals this year. Leave it there. Kendrick Perkins really enjoyed the chat. Thanks for joining us on the show. Oh, and thanks for having me, man. And keep up the great work, man. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com fieldofgreens.com. The two most watched college quarterbacks had opposite feelings about their victories on Saturday. Shador Sanders, the college athlete with the highest NIL earning power, according to On3, had the day's most dramatic moment when he tied the game at the end of regulation with a 43-yard Hail Mary to LeJonte Wester. The Buffaloes won in overtime, 38-31. The legend grows for Sanders and Travis Hunter, who forced a fumble to end the game, who will be top draft picks next year. Meanwhile, another college QB with a famous last name gave himself a C-plus for his performance, but you wouldn't know it from the score. Arch Manning threw an interception on his first possession, but settled in for two touchdowns and 258 yards. The Longhorns didn't require any Hail Marys. They beat UL Monroe 51-3. Manning will cede the starting job back to Quinn Ewers whenever he's healthy, but it's not clear if he'll be ready for next week. And finally, James Madison beat UNC by a score that I initially assumed was for a basketball game. UNC scored 50 points, but it wasn't nearly enough. JMU wrote a seven-touchdown performance from quarterback Alonza Barrett III to a 70-50 to win. To add insult to injury, UNC paid $500,000 for the matchup. The loss was bad enough that UNC coach Mac Brown had to reassure reporters after the game that he was not resigning. Formula One is putting their money where their mouth is when it comes to swearing. Max Verstappen was fined for dropping an F-bomb at a press conference on Thursday prior to the weekend's race in Singapore. The three-time champion was fined around $45,000 for the profanity. Verstappen had been previously dismissive of F1's attempts to curtail drivers' language, and he did not change his tune after being fined. He gave terse answers to reporters at a following press conference. At one point, he told reporters that he had preferred they ask their questions outside the press conference room, where presumably he could speak more freely. Verstappen does have good reason to curse. After spending the first part of the season looking like Red Bull was going to cruise to another dominant season, they have been passed by McLaren in the constructors' standings, and Lando Norris is hot on Verstappen's heels for the Drivers' Championship. A while back, we covered the strange story of the Colorado University staffer who traveled to the Middle East without telling the school in the search for NIL money. No deal emerged from that, and before too long, the staffer, Trevor Riley, was no longer with the school. 
Reporter Jill Painter Lopez and my colleague AJ Perez has an exclusive story on frontofficesports.com on what exactly happened here, and they join us next. I'm joined now by LA-based freelance sports reporter Jill Painter Lopez and front office sports senior reporter AJ Perez. Welcome, AJ. Welcome, Jill. Thanks for having us. Hey. Great to have you on. Um, so, Jill, I'll start with you. Um, let's just get to the story here. Who is Trevor Trevor Riley, and how did he become associated with the Colorado football program? Well, Trevor Riley is is such a unique guy. He uh, I grew up Mormon in, in San Diego near Indian reservations and a great football player and played at Utah, then played in the NFL and wanted to become a coach. Um, young father, uh, raising three children as well. And he was able to be a high school football coach and then caught on with Deion Sanders. He just really uh, wanted to get on that uh, a train or that ship, as he called it, and Learned a ton from him at Jackson State. He was there for three years and all volunteer. Uh, worked behind the scenes, kind of trying to get some NIL money as NIL came into the forefront. Uh, and then followed him to Colorado and became a special teams coordinator there. And really made headlines as uh, he uh, as, as he told me. I uh, met with him on the Big Island uh, uh, last month and told me that he went to... Uh, Went to Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, Dubai in, in hopes of collecting uh, NIL money. Um, didn't tell anybody at Colorado, and, and therein kind of lies the, the, the problem for Trevor Riley. Yeah, and so, yeah, let's get into sort of the, the motivation, the sort of the why as to why he did that. Was it just basically that um, those countries, especially Saudi Arabia, are spending tons of money on sports and trying to, you know work their way into to the U.S. through sports in many ways. Um, and Colorado needed some NIL money. Is it kind of as simple as that? Sort of. I mean, and Colorado has an, an you know, an NIL like, collective that they hire as all schools. I mean, you're, you're behind the yeah. curve if you don't hire a company that's doing this for you now. So, um, but he was unhappy with what they were doing. He says he was trying to recruit and just couldn't get the players that he needed because, uh, you know, we've seen Nick Saban say it used to be when you went into a recruit's living room, they'd ask what about their playing time and when they're going to start. And now it's how much money can you give me? So uh, you're you're behind if you can't get enough money to be able to recruit the kind of players that you need if you want to get in that, uh, you know, in the 12 team playoff. So uh, he took it upon himself to do that because he was unhappy uh, with a uh, blueprint. And before that, the two other companies uh, that were trying to collect NIL money. And Saudi Arabia, yes, he thought to himself, I mean, there's countries that have money. He didn't think it was a problem. Now, all of us can say uh, Saudi Arabia money, or, you know, Middle Eastern money yeah. for a public university, that's probably not going to go over real well. Yeah. And also, he didn't say that he was going. So clearly, he, he seems like he thought that someone might object. <laughs> well, Otherwise, he, he probably would have announced that he's going. <laughs> That's also true. But he did tell me that he's a guy that gets stuff. I'll use that, that a, a mm -hmm. nicer word. He gets stuff done. He's a very mm -hmm. believable guy. When, when I sat down with him, I thought he was very believable um, and that he probably didn't tell anybody. And he, he just wants to get stuff done. He said, here's this stuff, you know, uh, on the table. He said he wasn't going officially, but he was using CU and, and, and talking about Deion Sanders and talking about the university. Uh, so, so maybe of course not official wasn't signing anything but at the same time you're attaching uh, these big names to potential saudi arabia you know middle eastern money and and mm -hmm. and that could be a very big potential problem yeah yeah um uh, so i think let's get into his middle eastern trip it seems like most of the action was in saudi arabia do we know much about his his time in jordan and dubai just to get those out of the way uh, we do. I mean, he well, his trip in, in, in Jordan, that's where he started. Um, he had somebody that he met there to kind of show him the ropes. And all of those meetings, he said, you know, that uh, they were like, it's interesting, but we're not interested right now. And so he wanted to then go to Saudi Arabia because people in Jordan, he said, even told him that's where the money is. So uh, and, and that's why he went in the first place, because he knew that that's where the money was. Yeah. So he goes to Saudi Arabia and it sounds like he just kind of showed up and looked for people to talk to just based on your story that he's, you know, looking for a meeting somewhere. 
A thousand percent. He said he was walking around a government complex for eight hours that day. He got some emails, emailed people. And and uh, he did say that, I mean, I just can't imagine. I mean, he's a very tall, imposing, you know, former NFL linebacker, you know, walking around in his thwab in Saudi Arabia uh, talking about college football. So, but he did say he made some contacts uh, with uh, a couple of people who worked there, who went to universities uh, here in the U.S., and by the next day, he had a meeting and uh, he said, you know, she showed him the pitch deck, which which uh, AJ was able to uh, to get. Um, and, uh, you know, they basically said, hey, let's get back in, in a couple of weeks with with stuff on your end, Trevor, and, and stuff on their end. The, let's get us a proposal. And when he get, got back, not only did did people uh, in, in Boulder uh, seem kind of cool towards what he was doing, but nothing happened. Yum. And AJ, what was he pitching exactly? Lots of Dion and Dion related uh, kind of, you know, we, we got obviously Dion Sanders, you know, there is a, in one of the pitches, he mentions the KFC ads that, that, that he's doing, um, you know, his, his two kids who are playing actually three, he, he mentioned all four, a well, four of his kids actually one and one, a woman's basketball player transferred since this, that whole pitch, um, the, which the, uh, this was basically between Christmas and New Year's last year. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of uh, really, even though Dion, there's no, there's nothing points back to him to, of his knowledge or he, or him even knowing, even w- right after he got back what happened. But they were really leaning into uh, Dion's uh, kids, including Shiloh, Shador, um, and Dion Jr., who is not even on, is not even enrolled at CU. So, but it's like they, they basically, and they use the CU Buffs uh, social media account. So they said 10 million followers are trying to get $10 million out of PIF. Um, and uh, Saudi, the public investment fund is obviously the big funder for, the major funder for Live Golf, the almost the sole funder of Live Golf. And uh, they have F1, they've made other inroads uh, where, you know, U.S. fans could, you know, have probably interacted with a lot of it. Obviously, PIF invests in a lot of other things from Uber to a lot of other companies. So they're involved. They, 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 they spread it around. But the fact that it's public university money, and I think, I don't know, uh, I'll, I'll let Jill explain why, why Trevor thought this was a, you know, <laughs> the gas station story, uh, why he thought this was all, this was fine. But uh, if you, Jill, if you want to fill in, like, why maybe he not, maybe Trevor not knowing the um you know the lightning rod or is this kind of this kind of issue that this could this could create but uh he uh trevor just kind of laid out to to jill um why he went after it well and he said i mean i think he didn't see a real problem with it until he got back because he's thinking i need money these guys have money that they want to invest in sports he he said the one thing he kept hearing was uh, Saudi Arabia wants to to get you know million x million more I think it was five hundred million AJ visitors uh, to their country and he just saw it as a way. Now when he got back, I, I said, now didn't you foresee this problem? You, you knew people might be upset about taking uh, this kind of money, and he said. Hey, there's seven gas stations in around Boulder that the athletic department has used gas for over the years. They've probably spent that type of money just in getting this gas alone. And it's like, well, that, that's that's not a direct tie. So um, he, he really just just saw like, I have a job to get done. I'm the guy that gets stuff done. He said, I bet on myself. I'm going to go over there and then I'm going to lay it out for them. And, and, and again, public university. Uh, oh, and I think that there will be a private university or a smaller school that's going to do this. And it's going to create a ripple effect, perhaps. Uh, but I just don't see how a public university with that tie, how that would work, you know, student athletes or anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's right. I mean, I think there's too much need for money. And unless there's a wall put up by the NCAA or the U.S. government or someone, um, I think someone's going to take the plunge and it's going to make it that much easier for the next school to do it to. Mm-hmm. Um, just to finish the the Trevor story here, he gets back to Colorado. He basically gets, it sounds like he got froze out by the university. Um, yeah, I guess he was terminated or it was, he resigned or he, he was uh, he was no longer with the university before too long. But before there was a period where like his kids couldn't walk around the school and these are like not you know adult kids these are you know like what 9 11 13 somewhere in there mm-hmm. um who um yeah couldn't walk around like without being supervised is that right 
Yeah, and I and I think so. What what happened there was his kids used to have total access, so um, he is no longer with the mom of, of of the children. So when he's got the nine, eleven, and thirteen year old now, I, you you have to know they're not two, four, and six, so they can monitor themselves. Uh, they do their homework there. Uh, they were able to eat there. They would be able to be at practice there. And, and Trevor said, I mean, you, one thing you can say whatever you want about Trevor, but uh, he loves talking about his kids. And he, he does love his kids. So he said that was the big problem for him. Now, he was never forced to resign. I talked to him about that. And he said, no, that that was his decision. When he returned from that trip, uh, he was uh, super upset that he felt like, hey, everybody's just dropping the ball on this. Uh, there was a person uh, at uh, Blueprint that he said no longer wanted to work with him because he was on them like, hey, let's not let this thing go. I've, I've got this you know, potential deal here. And he just wasn't understanding why nobody was working on it. And then he said, uh, the thing happened with his kids where he was told um, by uh, somebody on the support staff uh, that his kids couldn't be there unless they were supervised the whole time. So um, they, again, they had, you know, free access and old enough where they weren't going to be causing, you know, a ruckus and things like that. He said they were very well behaved. Um, they've been around football all their lives. So he said, he said that wasn't a problem, but for him, it was a problem. I believe that these are things that are starting to happen to kind of push him out. He's a special teams coordinator. There's this like, there's that the college coaches, assistant coaches, even head coaches, they don't go after NIL money, especially not to go and fly halfway across the world. Um, this is like something that I kind of, uh, it's kind of just, I've never seen before. I'm sure, I'm sure it's happened a few times where an assistant coach knows a company, knows a CEO they went to school with or something and hooks them up and with the, with the business side or with the, with the NL collective, but he was actively going, <laughs> looking for money everywhere to help, you know, they, we got the projection this year. It was around, it was $8 million is the projected NIL money, which is about double what it was last year at Colorado. So I'm not sure how much that's attributed to, uh, to Trevor, probably not much. It's probably the blueprint taking over in March. Uh, they have 26, 27 schools, um, including Penn state and uh, some other major programs. So it's, uh, you know, yes, he, it's part of his job to make recruiting easier and getting NIL money is one path to it. But I've never seen an assistant coach or any any coach in any sport in college sports that has gone to the links that Trevor Riley did to to try to just kind of you know boost the coffers and uh, be being able to offer these uh, you know students uh, I'm not going to say student athletes these college players more money mm -hmm. and yeah. and to to kind of piggyback off what AJ uh, just said um, he did this at Jackson State also so perhaps he didn't recognize that you were. This is a big time major division one program, uh, not to take anything away from Jackson State, but, uh, you know, you may have been able to get a lot away with a lot more at Jackson mm -hmm. State uh, than in Boulder. So, uh, you know, he was going uh, before he went to Saudi Arabia, he went to Utah. That's where he has a lot of connections to business people and, and uh, others to try and get money there, too. So he was really kind of going outside the bounds. It was the off season, if you will. Right. So uh, he felt like, hey, I'm going to try and get stuff done. Yeah. Very interesting story. I feel like there's going to be ripple effects of this. Jill Painter Lopez, AJ Perez, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. The Washington Nationals are headed toward their fifth losing season in a row, but there are some bright spots for the team, including a productive year from 23 year old Abrams, the team's lone all star. Abrams, however, was demoted to the minor leagues on Saturday, not for his performance, but because he stayed up until 8 a.m. at a casino. Abrams was not violating the league's gambling policy, which forbids betting on baseball or being involved with legal bookmakers, but has nothing to say about playing blackjack. Abrams is getting this treatment because it's a bad look and not how the team wants him spending his time, especially with a game the next day. MLB could suspend him if they deem his actions as against the interests of the league, but the Nationals may have covered him for, for that with their actions. It's not the dumbest thing a 23-year-old has done, but it's not a great look, and hopefully Abrams can use this as a learning moment and get the most out of his considerable talent. Sticking with baseball, the Chicago White Sox fell to the Padres for their 120th loss of the season, tying the 1962 Mets for the most losses ever. It's one thing to be a middling team that has to try to find the bright side. With the White Sox, there is no upside, at least not this year. And the team's social media feed is having fun with the situation. Instead of simply posting the final score of each game, the team is posting things like final, the other team scored more runs than us, and final, score available on MLB app. 
there's a theory around fiascos that once you get to a certain level of bad, people start rooting for atrocious. Things are bleak on the South Side, but at this point, it might be more fun to be a fan of them than just some teams that are just consistently mediocre. Time for Front Office Sports tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. Bryce Young is becoming one of the more intriguing stories of this NFL season now that he's on the sidelines. The 2023 first overall pick has been drawing trade interest from teams that still see plenty of potential in him. For now, the Panthers are turning down inquiries, but at some point they will have to decide if they are all in or all out on the young QB. They didn't trade up for the top pick to make him a backup. That's it for today. Subscribe, rate, and review wherever you like to tune in, and send us a note at today at frontofficesports.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.